This is Megaton Murphy, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by Eric Reed. Chapter 1 I'll be honest, this time last week, I didn't hardly even know what a nuclear explosion was. I'm 22 now, and I was 12 when we dropped the bombs, so I do know some of the names and the dates and that kind of stuff. You know what they tell you in school. The thing about that is, I didn't exactly stick around in school for too long. So, even though people might be surprised to hear it given what kind of job I've been doing for the last two years, I probably know less than the average guy on the street. If I hadn't been working at that one bar on that one night, I never would have ended up here. None of this would have happened. That's all spilled milk to me right now, but a story does have to start at the beginning. It was a regular Tuesday night, right until closing time, when a guy in a suit walked up to the bar. He was dressed way too smart for that place. I told him he was too late for any more drinks, but that wasn't what he wanted. He told me he'd been there for a while and had heard me telling stories to all different kinds of customers all night. See, I was never good at the reading and the counting, but even the teachers who didn't like me used to say I was good at telling stories. One of my favorite words is meander, and that's something I've been known to do. I always had trouble concentrating. I didn't get my fuck Sue's on medicine until after I gave up on school, when I lost a finger at the steelworks and the doctor did a whole bunch of tests to make sure nothing else was wrong. It turned out I had some lead poisoning, was what he said, probably from when I was a baby, and it might have stunted my development. I didn't think that was the nicest thing to say, but he said it in a pretty nice kind of voice at least, and he was a good guy to offer me the new medicine. Fuck Suzon was part of a trial that I didn't even have to pay for, which was just as well since I couldn't barely even pay for the bus ride each time I had to collect my supply. Anyways, I'll meander back to that night at the bar. This hotshot looking guy in the suit said there was something about my way of speaking that made it hard to stop listening and that he was looking for someone to do some talking for tour groups at some kind of facility down in Nevada. He said they could pay me pretty good, but that the real good thing would be the tips an entertaining guy like me could make. I don't think no one had ever called me an entertaining guy before, and I liked the sound of what this guy was telling me. I didn't have any ties to the bar, so I agreed to the guy's offer of a two-week trial run, fully paid. He was only in town for a funeral, and I went out west with him when he headed back out there the next day. My new boss in the suit turned out to be a pretty high-up guy named Hanson. He had a thing for last names, so always insisted on calling me Murphy instead of Darren, just like he insisted on me calling him Hanson instead of Mr. Hanson or whatever his first name is. Huh. In two years, I guess I never found that out. But yeah, two years. Everything went well in those first two weeks, and really, Everything went well for two years, right till last week. I didn't want for all this to happen, but I'm not here to pretend it didn't. I'm not here to pretend I didn't do what I did. All I'm here to do is get my side of the story out. I'm not a monster. Please, you gotta believe me. Chapter 2 I worked as a tour guide at the Sandpoint Nuclear Test Facility. My job was to take people around the built for bomb and empty town and bring it all to life. We called it a show town because it's not tiny like a model town and it's not a ghost town that everyone up and left. It's a town on a test site to show what can happen. From the moment I first walked into the silent town square, I knew it was going to be the easiest job I ever had. The place was so creepy, so weird, so not like anywhere else. It was going to capture everyone's attention, with or without a good guide. Most weekdays I'd have three or four school groups, 
Then at the weekends, it was tourists who sometimes came from way further than you might expect. My contract was for weekdays, and that's what Hanson paid me for, but I worked weekends for no official pay just to get my hands on those tourist tips. Don't get me wrong, I liked engaging with the school kids and giving them something to laugh about after the boring lectures and slideshows they have to watch in the education center before they get to wander around the town. The trouble was, the kids don't have no money, and teachers don't tip. So those days I was making less than I did on a good day at the bar. But the weekends? I made out like a bandit. We got all sorts of visitors, thanks to Hanson and his idea to advertise the place in Vegas. Things were really taking off in the city when I moved west, and none of that has slowed up. We'd usually get families and couples, but once or twice, I had some mob guys looking for private tours. A lot of my style was about jokes and doing little scares on the tourists, like when I'd have the mannequins all set up to fall forward when someone opened the door. I was worried about hacking off the wrong guys, but it turns out those types love laughing at each other and can usually take a joke with their group as long as there ain't no outsiders around to see it. And the tips from those guys? They'd make you wonder where the money came from, if you didn't already know. As it all turned out, I had a late night in one of the big new casinos the night before the incident. That wasn't my usual scene, but it was my roommate Benny's birthday, and he loves to gamble. Really, he loves anything that smells like a way of making money without working for it, and he'd tell you that himself. The problem with the late night was that it made me have a late morning, as a late night often does. I still got to work just in time for my first tour, but only because I didn't have to clock in at the compound's main staff area. I had my own thing going, and I always drove straight to the show town. Anyways, it was a long day. My third tour group had a really difficult kid who the teacher couldn't control and who even the other rowdy ones couldn't keep up with. He was a tough one to get along with, I'll just say that. I don't know how much you know, but the buildings in our show town are as realistic as you could imagine, with all the furniture and everything else. Mannequins, fake food on the table, you name it. We don't have any glass, but other than that, it feels pretty much like wandering around somewhere when no one's home. You kind of feel like that goldy-haired girl in the story with the three bears. This kid was moving stuff around, banging on surfaces, just being a real pain in everyone's ass. I can never say too much to a group member without getting in trouble, especially a kid. And after getting practically no sleep overnight, he was the last thing I needed six hours into a long day. His poor teacher apologized at the end of the tour, and all I could say was I was glad I didn't have to deal with the kid every day like she did. And listen, I ain't blaming the kid. I stayed up too late. I didn't wake up early enough and I made the next mistake too. That one's on me. The fourth tour group couldn't make it on account of a problem with their bus, so it turned out that I got some time to myself. Like I said before, I like guiding the kids around, but that day, I needed a break. I almost did a little dance when I heard they weren't coming. On any other day, I would have gone home early, but that day, I knew Benny had some guys visiting. I knew they were probably pretty shady, and I put my foot down that they had to be gone when I got home from work. The tips I got were great, like I said, but living ain't cheap, and I was trying to save for a real place. Putting up with a roommate like Benny was the price of that, I guess, and he wasn't all bad. Anyways, I didn't want to go home early when we'd made that deal. I also didn't really want to go to the staff room at the compound like I might have done if I'd had two and a half hours to kill a few months ago. We got a new receptionist last year, Cindy, and things were good between us for a while. Really good, you could say. But then it all got awkward, and sitting there with just her wasn't something either of us would want. Really, there was no place else for me to go, so I just stuck around. In hindsight, I was definitely taking the goldy hair comparison from earlier too far, 
because what I did next was to sit down on the bed and decide that it was just right. I even thought I was being smart by setting the real alarm clock on the dresser to go off in two hours. When I glanced in the newfangled safety mirror above the dresser and saw how tired I looked, I decided it should probably be a while before I had another night in Vegas. If I'd known what would be looking back in that mirror when I glanced at myself again a few hours later, I would have never lay down. You're probably guessing by now that my alarm clock didn't do its job, and if you are, then you're guessing right. Like I said earlier, I have my own gig here, and I always drive straight in and straight out. I was never late and had never hung around longer than I was supposed to. I mean, why would I? Why did I? By accident was all, and I guess no one sees accidents coming. I woke up in the dark to the sound of an alarm that I swear on my life must have been created to wake the dead. My ears were pounding, and it only took a few seconds for my heart to join them. I rushed to the empty window frame and saw the least welcome sight of my life, a red light flashing in the distance. It was coming. There was no sense in running. It was already too late. Chapter 3 I knew the actual house wasn't going to be destroyed for at least a few more years and that the detonations we tested out there weren't close to the level of what goes on at other sites, but Hanson and everyone else had still told me a million times never to be there at the wrong time. All kinds of safety checks made sure radiation levels were never too high after one of the blasts, and the fact that no one at Sand Point had ever gotten sick was a pretty good sign to me that the checks were good enough. So, we had checks after the small-scale tests, and we had warnings never to be around. And don't think I didn't hear those warnings echoing in my mind even as the alarm pounded away in my brain. It was almost like they were teasing me, telling me I should have paid more attention and never should have gone out to the casino with Benny when I had work the next morning. The warnings teased me because there I was, smack dab in the middle of the wrong place at the wrong time. Worst of all, I had no time to be any place else. There was no plan for what to do in this scenario, kind of like there's no plan for what a lion tamer should do once the lion has its jaws around his head. All my safety training, which wasn't all that complicated, was about making sure I never ended up in this situation to begin with. To clear one thing up, you really don't have to tell me I'm an idiot for sleeping on this job. Believe me, I already know. I usually stop by the main compound at lunchtime, and that's when I'd see if there was a notice on the board about any test they might be running, since I'm never there in the morning like everyone else. But I was just so tired from the night before. I ate my lunch in the car and closed my eyes for a few minutes. It wasn't exactly what you'd call comfortable, which I guess is why I opted for the bed when I decided to have a bigger rest later in the day. You gotta understand the tests are pretty rare too, so I'm gonna say there was some bad luck about all this. But I do know I should have been a lot more careful, and I won't pretend otherwise. If you don't know the show town, you might wonder why I didn't run, but there really was nowhere to go. The whole idea is that the town is in the blast zone and the rest of the compound isn't, so it's a pretty good drive. The kids come in their buses and I have my car, but it would have taken minutes to get to a safe spot and I knew I only had seconds. If I'd parked my car on the other side of the house, someone might have been able to see it from the compound in the surveillance scope. Then they'd have known I was here and surely would have halted the test but I parked where I always park, so of all the things to beat myself up for, I don't think that's one of them. I thought about sheltering in the car, but I figured I might be safer in the bedroom closet, three doors away from the outside and with no glass to shatter like what happened to the car windows. When I was a kid, my Uncle Jay used to laugh at me for closing my eyes when I was hiding, as if it would make a difference to whether he could find me. I guess hiding in the closet was like that, but at least I felt like I was doing something to protect myself. The alarm stopped right after I got in, 
and all of a sudden the only thing I could hear was my heart. It couldn't have been five more seconds until all I could hear was nothing at all. It was already dark in the closet, but when the blast hit, it got dark everywhere. When the blast hit, it got a different kind of dark. Instantly, I was out. I was gone. The old me was dead. Chapter 4 I don't know how long I was blacked out. When I stumbled out of the closet, the alarm clock I had set up was on the floor. It had been knocked down by the radioactive air that burst through the bedroom door. The closet door had held firm, but I could still feel the heat on my skin, along with a weird, disoriented feeling in my head. I really was stumbling with every step. I was a little bit surprised the force hadn't been enough to knock over the dresser, and I definitely put that down to the type of detonation, not the thickness of the doors. Even in the living room, none of the bigger furniture had toppled. Dining chairs, for sure, but not the wooden sideboard or the table. Maybe I got lucky with the scale of the detonation, I thought. After gazing around the living room from the bedroom door, I went back in to check myself over in the mirror. I only know it's not made of glass, and I wish I could remember the word for the material it is made of, but the point is, it was still there. That was how I saw myself. My skin felt hot, but no worse than it might have felt after falling asleep in the sun. It was bad, for sure, and it also looked it. My skin tone was all of a sudden halfway to a lobster's, but on balance I'd kind of expected to see something worse. I still had all my skin, for one thing, and looking like a lobster-colored man was better than looking like I was wearing a scary monster mask with a melted face. The fact I was standing up and seeing anything at all was the main thing anyways, I figured, so if a red face was all I'd walk away with, then I could count myself one lucky boy. I looked out at my car and saw that it hadn't been so lucky. I could see it under the town streetlights, which had no real glass component, like the mirror in the bedroom, and that light was more than enough to show me that every window was blown in. On top of that, the four flat tires didn't look like they'd be going anywhere soon. There were no two ways about it. I was going to have to walk. None of the plumbing in the show town actually worked, but I always had a canteen full of water in my car, so I knew I'd have that if nothing else. When I was doing a final check around the house, which I would say had been disturbed more than it had been damaged, I noticed that the radiation meters on the walls were all showing numbers that were much higher than I'd ever seen. Granted, I'd never been there when a blast hit, but one of the counters was a kind that shows the highest reading it's ever recorded, and I swear the reading had never been nearly so high as it was then. I knew I was going to be in huge trouble for falling asleep, so I decided that as long as I didn't start feeling much worse, I wasn't going to go to a doctor. Just in case, though, I decided to take the counter. It might be important to show someone just how much radiation I'd been exposed to, I figured. The counter was secured to the wall pretty damn hard, so I really had to pull. It was at that moment I realized I didn't just look different due to the blast. I was different. When I put my mind and my arm into taking the counter from the wall, the strangest thing happened. I didn't just take the counter. I took a chunk of the whole damn wall. I froze, shocked by my own apparent strength. It has to be the kind of walls they used, I told myself. This isn't a real house. On my way outside, I decided to put my mind into pulling a doorknob as hard as I could. And as sure as my name is Darren Murphy, the whole damn door came off its whole damn hinges. I'd opened that door a thousand times, and I'd had to tell kids more than I could count to stop pulling on it. For instance, the difficult kid that very day. As much as I didn't want to believe it, that kind of timing couldn't be no coincidence. To settle it in my mind, I walked to my unusable car before I got out of Sandpoint for what I figured might well have been the last time. 
I didn't know everything for sure about the construction of the walls and doors in the house, but I knew my car. I won't lie. I felt like a dummy as I psyched myself to try and tip over a full-sized car. But when I crouched down and went for it, squatting with my hands under the passenger side door, I tipped it over like there should never have been a doubt. I didn't tip it like it was nothing. There was exertion, for sure. But I tipped it. I tipped it. I tipped a car. Chapter 5 I jogged away from the show town and straight past the main compound, not stopping until I got to the road. I tucked the radiation counter into my waistband, along with a little chunk of wall I ripped off along with it. I hitched a ride until I was nearly home and told the driver my face had always been red like that. I happen to think it's kind of rude to ask a man a question like that, but I guess I can understand. It was really red. It hadn't always been that way, obviously, and I hoped it wouldn't always keep being like that. But it wasn't like I could tell him the truth. I had to get home and sleep on it, hope I woke up feeling clear-headed, and decide whether I thought talking to a doctor or coming clean to Hanson about what happened might be the best idea after all. As the drive went on, I started to think Hanson was going to find out at daybreak anyway when the analysis team went in to test everything and saw that my car was there. I was only thinking of all that because I didn't want to lose my job. It paid so well, and I liked it more than any other I'd ever had. Being on site during a live test was a hands-down firing, no questions asked, so I didn't want anyone to know. Every extra minute of the drive also made me think more and more that my job was just a little thing compared to the main thing, though, and that main thing was that I had somehow been changed by the blast. I was stronger, and right then I started to wonder what else I might have been, too. I took care with the guy's door when I left the car and thanked him for the ride, because I didn't know yet that my new power of super strength only came when I was trying to be strong. At my door, I took care again and then tried to slink into my room without Benny noticing. I know he'd have some fair questions about my face and where my car was, and dealing with them was just about the last thing I felt like doing. He took that option out of my hands, though, because when I got to my room, he was already in there, rifling through my drawers like they were his. Hey, man, you still got those chips from the casino last night? He asked. I'm going back tonight, and I thought I had them, but they're not. When Benny saw my face, he stopped talking right away. His mouth fell open. Damn, Murph, are you okay? Did something happen? I gulped and squeezed the radiation counter in my hand even tighter than I already was. I didn't know what to say, and I definitely didn't want him to see it. Benny plays a lot of cards, and he doesn't miss much so I shouldn't have been surprised when he noticed I was holding something. Long story short, he wanted to see what it was. He's a much bigger guy than me, even though we're roughly the same height, so when he decided to try to pry my hand open, I pushed him back as hard as I could. Even longer story short, Benny crashed into the wall, and he was mighty pissed off about it until I opened my mouth and blurted out what happened. With no real choice but to do it, I told him that I could now move heavier stuff than he would believe until he saw it with his own eyes. That calmed down his rage, and you could definitely say that wonder took over. He stood with his mouth open as I showed him my strength using an armchair, the refrigerator, and everything else he challenged me to move. There were bound to be limits to my new powers, and the exertion I felt when I tipped the car made me think a car was pretty close to the line. But nothing in the house gave me any kind of difficulty. Benny being Benny, he promised to keep my secret quiet if I would head back to the casino with him that night and try to use this new power of ours to the fullest. That's what he said, this new power of ours. He promised one night was all we'd need, and he had me over a barrel with his threats to tell my boss that I fell asleep on the job. 
I didn't pay much attention to the details at first, but it was something about a certain kind of slot machine that could be cheated with magnets and by tipping it off balance. The casino security guys were already smart to big magnets being used on other kinds of machines, he said. But I, with my new power, I should be able to tip this particular machine enough to let a tiny magnet do the rest. His end of the bargain was to sneak one of those little magnets in. One hour could make us more money than a year at that place you work, he said. And if we move between a few of the casinos, I think one night could set us up for life. Okay, I'll admit it. That sounded good. But I still want you to know that I didn't do it because I wanted to. I did it because I had to. Chapter 6 I didn't really enjoy being in the casino the night before the blast, and I definitely didn't enjoy it the night after. Benny picked me up some ladies' makeup to calm down my face before we went in, and I guess that was a smart move. We didn't exactly know what we were doing, but by the time we were done, I really did just look badly sunburnt instead of, well, whatever the hell I actually was. We played some cards because Benny said you can't just scam them right away. If he'd ever bothered to ask me, I would have said we probably can't scam them at all. But what he knew about my day meant that he was calling the shots for our night. I won a little bit of money at the table, then lost some of it at the slots, again like Benny told me to. We made no secret of arriving together since that would supposedly help me act more naturally, and I suppose it did. I'm not speaking ill of Benny here, but he's always been into some shady thing or another. He'd tell you that himself. So when his slot machine trick turned out to work, I wasn't all that surprised. All that surprised me was that the machine's vulnerability was known in his shark circle before it was known to the casino. Benny told me that someone was going to pull a monster haul soon and that the game would be up as soon as they did, so it might as well be us. He said that so far, the handful of guys who knew about the trick had been taking small amounts, skimming a little, to avoid too much suspicion. When we walked to the machine, he whispered in my ear, You know what they say, Darren. You can shear a sheep a hundred times, but you can only skin it once. And tonight, that skin is ours. I was worried that winning too much would get the attention of the security staff but Benny said we were only going to hit each Target casino for a single jackpot. Well, it didn't come to that. We didn't get busted for winning too much money. We got busted way before then. Tilting the slot machine wasn't a problem for me, but tilting it subtly sure as hell was. Hey! a security guard yelled. Before I knew it, Benny had bolted for the door, and I was being swarmed by huge guys. I was able to break free a few times, even when they piled on top of me on the ground. A crowd of confused gamblers was watching everything unfold, and I caught sight of some of their expressions. While I was fighting for my freedom, and for all I knew it, my life, they were watching in awe at one small guy out-muscling a whole horde of security staff. Just after I threw them all off my back and got to my feet, winning the loudest gasps yet from the crowd, one final guy came from behind and grabbed my left wrist. The weirdest sensation ran up my arm when he held the pressure point on the inside of my wrist, right where you check a pulse, and he could tell from my reaction that I felt it. Another one of the original group grabbed my other wrist. They knew there was something special about me, something odd, by how easily I had got out of their pileup. Now it seemed like they had stumbled on how to disarm it by putting pressure on my wrist. They dragged me through the casino and into a back room, where there were no more staff uniforms on anyone I saw. The guys in here looked just like the mob guys I sometimes guided around the showtown, and that's when I knew I was in real trouble. The room was crazy. There were piles of cash everywhere I looked, and there were girls in outfits that told me they'd just come off a stage. I didn't like the language some of the security guys were using in front of the ladies when they told the bosses about what I'd done, but I guess that's not the main point. One of the mob-looking guys slowly stood up, 
Everyone else fell silent. You come to my house, he said, speaking even more slowly than he rose, and you rob from me? I gulped. There was nothing I could say, and with the guys holding my wrists, there was somehow nothing I could do. I couldn't muster any more strength than normal, and my normal strength was nowhere near enough to get free. Right at that moment, from nowhere, the back door burst open and almost half a dozen police-looking guys burst in. The mob guys didn't run. Guys like them don't run. But their security underlings who were holding me did. I thought they'd sure as hell pay for that, but I was just glad the law was here. Money wasn't the only thing lying around, but the way the officer at the front turned once he was in the room told me something I really hadn't seen coming. They weren't there for the mob. They were there for me. Hands where I can see them, Murphy, he demanded. I didn't know how he knew my name, and I didn't have any time to think about it. With my wrists free, I thought I could at least try to do something. Not that my mind was overflowing with options, but before I could do anything, it was already too late. The leading officer shot me point blank with some kind of dart to the thigh, then another to my opposite arm. I slumped to the floor, and for the second time in a single day, I felt my whole world go dark. Chapter 7 When I came around, I was in the back of a car that was going pretty fast, with a bag over my head and something around each of my wrists. My hands were cuffed, but there was something else, too. Something tighter and less sharp. Without the use of my eyes, it was hard to tell, but they kind of felt like bracelets, just with something like a dime on each of my pulse points. I couldn't break out of the cuffs because I didn't have my new power, seemingly because of this whole wrist thing. In the casino, I wasn't able to free myself once the security guys had a hold of my wrists. They worked that out by luck, I figured, but I had a feeling that whoever was driving the car knew more than they did. These guys knew my name, for one thing, and they had these bracelet things ready to go. I called out to say I'd talk. Anything to get out of that moment of being driven to who knows where, helpless as a kitten. But none of my calling did any good. All I could do then was wait. And at least it wasn't too much longer until we drew to a stop. The bag was off my head almost right away, maybe half a minute later and then I was looking again at the same lead officer, the guy who in the ten most confusing seconds of my life had first saved me from the mob and then tranquilized me, all for reasons I wasn't sure I even wanted to know. I glanced at my wrists and saw two bands that looked pretty much exactly how I'd guessed they would. They looked like they were made of some galvanized material, and sure enough, the bands were solid loops, except for some kind of disc-shaped object pressing into the underside of each wrist. There's a lot you don't understand, Mr. Murphy, the guy said. You're telling me, I thought. He introduced himself as Agent Jacobs, in the superior kind of way you'd expect from someone who calls himself Agent Anything. You're not in trouble, he told me. In fact, we need your help. Well... You know by now that I got my job as a tour guide because I can talk all day. But right then, right then I didn't have half an idea of what the hell I could say. So what I said was nothing. Jacobs helped me out of the car, then let me out of my cuffs. The wristbands stayed. There were three other guys standing beside the car, and I recognized one of them from earlier. I'm not saying the other two hadn't been there. They maybe just hadn't been as easy to remember as the tall, bald one. Anyways, they were all dressed the same and started showing me their badges. Detective this, federal that, special something or other. It all went five miles over my head. I was only looking at Jacobs. Where am I? I asked. That was when I learned that where you are is the thing that comes before everything else. It gives you a ground and it lets you move on to other questions like who you're with or what they want, but it has to come first. Not that I got an answer either way, because Jacob started prattling about how special I am and how important I can be, not just to my country, but possibly to the world as a whole. 
If I was confused before, I was flat out lost at that point. Another one of the guys said there was something they needed me to see. Then once they all led me away from the car, it couldn't have been more than a minute until we made it down a flight of stairs and stopped in front of a thick-looking metal door. The place I got out of the car looked like a hangar of some kind, and by now I was underneath it, which made me think I must have been in some kind of secret underground government facility. I've heard talk of stuff like that, but even seeing wasn't totally believing just yet. It was just so crazy. Jacobs told me less than 10 people had seen what I was about to see and that less than 20 knew it existed. He said there'd be no going back to my old life once I saw it, but with my powers blocked and so many guys surrounding me in an underground facility, I wasn't exactly in a position to weigh up my options. My old life was gone, and I figured that helping these guys could hardly get me in a spot any worse than the one I was already in. I held my breath as Jacobs opened the door. It turned out to lead into a small square room, which seriously couldn't have been any bigger than my bedroom. There was only one thing in it, but even if there had been more, I would have known which one to look at. There was no mistaking what these guys were hoping for. As my eyes took in the large metal chest, I knew they wanted me to open it. It looked pretty much how the treasure chests were described in every pirate adventure I'd ever read, which was more than a few, except it was smooth and all silver. The chest had all kinds of marks on it, which I guessed were from saws and hammers and whatever else the people who had seen this had used to try to open it. I guess you don't want to blow it open in case there's treasure that could get damaged? I asked them. Well, mainly Jacob's since he was the one who always walked beside me and the one I always looked at by default. His face was hard to read at first, but he shook his head after a few seconds. We're worried about what might be inside, period, he said. His voice was flatter than usual when he said it. It could be from the Soviets, one of his colleagues piped up, or maybe even space aliens. At Soviets, my eyebrows jumped halfway to my hairline. But at space aliens? I felt my stomach knot. I said the obvious thing. So why do you want me to open it? And this time I said it to the guy who introduced these scary words. I mean, I ain't afraid to say I was scared. Who wouldn't be? It didn't feel safe and I told him that. But Jacob said they had to find out what was inside and we were in the safest place to do it. We were underground and miles from anywhere which at least meant that any bad effects we felt wouldn't hit anyone else. Shouldn't hit anyone else, anyway. Nothing was for sure. I was hesitating until Jacobs held out some kind of magnet and pressed it against the tiny disc under my left wrist. It unlocked my bracelet, and he did the same thing with the other one. I knew what that meant. It meant I could use my powers again, and I thought it also showed how desperate these guys were. They knew what I was capable of, and here they were trusting me in the hope I would open the chest. Mr. Murphy, Jacob said, gulping away his last doubts. The safety of our nation and perhaps our world could depend on your ability to open this chest. Please, do what you can. The safety of the world? Well, that got me. I probably nodded about ten times, partly to show my agreement and partly to psych myself up. I thought back to the car I'd tipped over earlier in that longest of all days, and about how there was no way open in the chest could be harder than that. I crouched down, called upon the newfound strength I doubted I'd ever understand, and reached for the lid. Chapter 8 I put one hand on the main body of the chest before I gave the lid the strongest jank I could just in case it was lighter than I expected. After all, the last thing I wanted was to lift it from the ground so hard that it hit the ceiling. As it turned out, I didn't have to worry about that, because the lid was heavy as hell. I don't know what it was made of, but it had to be the densest thing I ever touched. Like with the car, trying to open the lid took a lot of effort, but like tipping the car, I managed to do it. To be honest, I wasn't all that surprised that the lid opened. 
the chest looked like it was supposed to be opened, and I thought the fact it was metal meant there could be some kind of magnet keeping it closed. I don't know much about magnets, and maybe I'm being dumb, but I figured that if I could tip a car, I could beat a magnet, and at least in this case, I was right. But if you want to talk about surprises, try being me when I peered into the mysterious chest and saw what was inside. Absolutely nothing. Jacobs walked up beside me and looked down. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, he said. He offered me the wristbands and said they were just to wear for a little while longer, but that I had done an important thing. I put them back on, figuring that these guys weren't so bad and also figuring I didn't know where I was and would have been shot on sight even if I escaped the facility and tried to run. So, what is it? I asked him. What's the chest? That's when things started to change. Jacobs told me that the whole thing with the chest had been a test. Or really two tests in one, as he put it. Firstly, a test of my patriotic trustworthiness, and secondly, a test of my enhanced strength. My reward for passing was going to be that I could see what went on at the facility. All my questions would get answered, he said, and everything was going to be okay since I'd been so cooperative. The things he was saying might not sound too bad to you now, but the way he was saying them made me feel like I shouldn't celebrate anything just yet. There was no talk of me getting out, for one thing, just being okay. One of Jacob's other guys told me the next door we went through wouldn't take us into an empty room and that we wouldn't be alone anymore. He asked if I could confirm that I'd been taking RNTL for more than two years, and when I didn't know what that was, he said it was one of the active ingredients in Fox Suzon. Fox Suzon is the brand name of the trial medicine the doctor gave me for my focus, and I knew that it was supposed to do something about the bad effects of lead poisoning like the kind I got when I was a baby. It was weird that they knew that about me, but I suppose the weirder thing was that they knew anything about me. Once guys like them knew my identity, getting a hold of my medical records probably wasn't too big of a deal. That's when Jacobs butted back in to say things were about to make a little more sense, and that I was lucky because it was testing hour. Testing hour, I said. He smiled. And when that door opened and I saw what was going on, when I saw what that son of a bitch was smiling about, I knew that one way or another, I had to get those bands off my wrists. Because I knew that whoever Agent Jacobs really was, his side wasn't one I wanted to be on. Chapter 9 No one who knows me would ever say I'm good at keeping my mouth shut, but right then I pressed my lips together like my life depended on it. From a high gantry looking down at a huge room being used for horrible purposes, Agent Jacobs talked and talked. Minutes passed. The tone was almost as bad as the words he proudly told me about the research he was in charge of, like I was supposed to share the enthusiasm he had for it. But let me tell you, none of that came close to the visuals. I was looking at row after row of human beings, almost all young guys like me, caged in see-through tanks like rats in a lab. Each tank had four metal chests in it with the biggest one looking about the same size as the one I just opened. Each of the tanks had two pipes feeding into it. I followed the lines and saw that one pipe from each tank was sending them something from a much wider pipe that went through the outer wall. The other pipes were all connected to a concrete vat in the middle of the floor. Aside from the test subjects, who were all trying hard to open their chests, but who all had the body language of broken men who had no choice to say no, the only people I saw on the floor were a couple of much older guys in lab coats. Those guys were writing stuff in their little notebooks, as if they were ticking off what kinds of birds they'd seen that day, instead of which tests their unwilling prisoners had passed. I think part of me didn't even want to know what it was all about but Jacobs was so proud to tell me all about this place that the answers came before much longer. The gist of what Jacobs told me was that the concrete vat contained a modified gas form of RNTL, the key ingredient in my Fox Suzon medicine, and the other pipes were giving the criminals controlled doses of radiation. 
Criminals was the word he used, like it took away those poor guys' humanity. In his eyes, they weren't even subjects or prisoners, just criminals. Jacob said my situation was a fortunate accident. That's what he called it. He also said a driver had called in a report of someone being burnt near the test site, the guy who picked me up, because he was worried something bad had happened and I didn't want to talk about it. Word about anything like that reaches a guy like Jacobs quickly, it seems, and he followed up with the bosses at work who did a sweep and found my car. I was under surveillance from that moment, and Jacobs wanted to see my intentions when I left home. He was surprised when I went to the casino, but he laughed about it and said it wasn't the stupidest idea to try to cash in. I didn't even bother saying it was Benny's idea. Benny, who abandoned me as soon as things got real. Anyways, he had jumped in when it looked like the mob might rough me up too much because apparently I'm an asset. That's what he said. I meandered again there, but I'll get back to RNTL. Jacobs also said that this kind of research first started with some scientist our government recruited from Germany after the war. He told some of his new American co-workers that exposure to RNTL had affected people in ways no one could have predicted. Even that German guy didn't know about the nuclear radiation idea at first, Jacobs said, but they had done stuff with chemical exposure that had effects they hardly believed. When the German joined our side and new animal tests showed clear results, Jacobs said they started doing human testing for the combination of RNTL and one certain kind of nuclear radiation. Just like in the mice, it made people stronger. The thing that excited him the most was that his team had never been allowed to give anyone anything close to the radiation dose I'd given myself when I fell asleep in the show town, so he was very excited to have me there. The Germans never had access to much RNTL because it comes from some weird part of a certain fungus or something like that, and one American company controlled the entire known supply of it. My doctor told me some of this one time about how no one can make RNTL without already having some, and that the company was going to get seriously rich from it. Then a little while later he was worried about my future supply of Fox Suzon, since no more was being made and he only had a year's worth in reserve. That was six months ago, and I've been trying not to worry about it. Fox Suzon definitely makes it easier for me to focus, but it's not like night and day and I always hoped he was wrong and someone would make more before I needed it. The doctor told me not to hold my breath on that because the guy who owned the company died and the government took it all over because they decided RNTL could be an important national asset. Even then, I just thought that was because we have enemies like the Soviets and we need access to medicine just like we need access to oil and stuff like that. Until last week, I used to not know if my doctor was maybe too much on the suspicious side, but he said he knew guys who knew for a fact that the government does all kinds of weird research on mind control and seeing what extreme conditions a body can survive. He said there was a gold rush for certain medicines and ingredients because of that, not just for using them as medicine. He thought the government might have been planning to use RNTL in their mind experiments, because it had already been given to people like me to test what it did to how well we could focus. I didn't know if I was ever going to have a chance to tell him, but he was pretty close. Maybe guys like Jacobs, who clearly weren't police at all, started researching RNTL and radiation combinations, thinking it would have mental effects and then got lucky when it had physical ones? I don't know, but it seemed like as good a guess as any. A lot to take in? You better believe it. Try being me, looking down at all those poor guys while I was hearing it. Jacobs told me more about the sweet spot they were searching for with each criminal, to find the ideal doses of radiation and RNTL to bring out the best response. He laughed when he said they also had to be careful never to give anyone too much power by accident in case they could smash their way out of their testing cell. He said none of them were violent criminals which it seemed like he thought was a good safety measure. By then, I was looking around for a way to break out of my wristbands, and I finally had an idea. I had to keep stalling, though, and to move along the gantry a little bit. So they don't live in these cells, 
I asked. I kept looking down, pretending to be more interested than angry, and I slowly started taking steps further along the gantry. The stupidest thing was, Jacobs looked offended. He said of course the criminals don't live in those tiny cages, because that would be inhumane. That would be inhumane. That was the hardest moment for me to keep a straight face, what with nuclear radiation and a powerful gas being piped into the poor guy's lungs. One particular prisoner caught my attention, because I saw that he was onto his fourth chest. I watched him try to open it, but he gave up after a few seconds. No one but you will ever open the fourth, Jacob said, seeing which cage I'd been looking into. I think that would be too much. He was walking with me by then, just like I wanted him to. I felt like I had to keep him talking to keep him walking, but I asked a question I also really did want the answer to. Too much for what? What's all this for? He took longer than usual to reply, like he was looking for the best words, then settled on just one. Improvement. I let my silence push for more, and he went on to say that there were huge security and military advantages to having enhanced men like these. Not these actual men, he pointed out, because these men were criminals to him and nothing more. The kind of strong men he wanted would be on the right side of the law, in the police force and the military. He did his horrible smile again before giving me the final line of his pitch. If you're looking for a nice little description, the one that got us a lot of secret funding was nuclear-powered super soldiers. That sent a shiver down my spine, and if it doesn't send one down yours, then I don't think you're listening. Nuclear-powered super soldiers, probably taking orders from men like Jacobs, who can so easily take people's humanity away by casting them as good-for-nothing criminals. After what happened that night, I kind of feared my own strength already. But the idea of that kind of power in the hands of people who would do things like this? I had to stop it. Just when I was getting ready to make my move, Jacobs gave his biggest smile yet. He said the very best part was that no one else could ever do this, because all of the RNTL in the world was in this room. So that's when I did it. And I'm sorry if I get shouty here or start tripping on my words, but what they were doing to them boys just wasn't right. You gotta remember, he'd already told me none of them were even violent criminals and that none of them had all that much extra power from the tests. Nothing like I had. Those are just things I want you to remember, that's all. One of the reasons I did what I did was for those boys in the cages, who I figured could have been me if certain moments in my life had gone other ways. The way I saw it, I couldn't not try to get them out of there. But the other thing on my mind was that I couldn't leave Jacobs and his crazy work in there so he could pick it all up again with a new batch of prisoners as soon as I left. I mean, come on. You're telling me that when the entire supply of RNTL was in that vat, and when RNTL was the one thing that could lead to superhuman soldiers doing the bidding of guys like Agent Jacobs, what, I was supposed to not do what I did? No. I'm sorry for some of what happened, but I ain't for a single second sorry for what I did. It had to be done, and there was no one else to do it. Judge me if you've gotta, but I know in my heart that I had to stop what they were doing. So with every ounce of this damn power I didn't ask for, that's exactly what I did. Chapter 10 It was all or nothing. The only time my bracelets and their power-blocking metal discs had come off so far was when Jacobs used a special magnet. The bands themselves seemed to be galvanized in some way, but they were still thin and felt like I could have cut through them if I had a knife. I didn't, obviously, but I had spotted something. At the far end of the gantry, and the spot I'd been trying to get to without anyone getting suspicious, there was a fire alarm box made of glass and a little chisel-style hammer mounted on the wall to smash it. I'd only have one shot, and I figured that even if I didn't get the wristbands off, I'd at least have a weapon to defend myself, or maybe hold against my own throat like I was threatening to hurt myself, 
since a hammer probably wouldn't do me much good against Jacob's dart gun and whatever else his guys were packing. While Jacob's was talking, I pushed my left hand against the hammer and pulled my right wrist downwards as fast as I could, right into the sharp edge. It worked. That was one out of two, and I didn't know for sure whether I'd have all, none, or some of my extra power with just one hand. Jacobs was stunned for a second and then lunged forward, but not before I switched hands and did the same movement again to free myself. Now I had the power for sure, and he knew it as well as I did. There was an access ladder leading down from the gantry, and it was right beside me. Most important of all, it was the only ladder there was, so I stepped back against the wall and smashed my fists into the gantry. It didn't break all the way on my first try, but I got it with a few more. Jacobs and the others couldn't get down, but I could. Best of all, I was shielded by the gantry when I climbed down, so they couldn't shoot. An alarm started pounding, and even though it was nothing compared to the one in the showtown, it still wasn't one you'd want to hear. I jumped from pretty high up and bent my knees, then got to work. Work was smashing the glass wall of each cage on my way down the main line. I told the first row of guys to help free the rest while I did something else. Well, two something else's, really. First, I smashed a hole in the wall of the whole room, on the same side as the gantry, since I figured that was going to be near the ultimate entrance and exit. Sure enough, I saw another ladder in there with a door at the top. In a facility like this, I didn't figure there were going to be hundreds of security guys, and probably not even dozens. But there were dozens of us, and we all had a little bit of extra juice in our blood, and no one more than me. With the right shields for charging at whoever was dumb enough to face us down, I fancied our chances. I ripped the ladder from its place when I was done with it, then carried it on my back to make it less likely I'd get hit by anything Jacobs and his goons might fire my way. I didn't hear any pinging sounds, but maybe the adrenaline just didn't let the sound through. Either that or they were already making the move. I didn't know. I called for the prisoners to start moving into the room I just opened, but I said I wouldn't take any of them out until everyone was free, so some of them had better make sure to smash open the last row. They did. This is when I'm going to say one more time that you've got to remember I knew these were non-violent criminals, and it seemed like they were chosen for this because they were so young. Maybe it wasn't my place to set them free, but only a devil would have left them there. I didn't free the last row with my own hands because I had my eyes on something else. The vat. I'll be honest and say I didn't think about the risk of what I did next. If I had, I might have done it anyway, since the pipes pushing the RNTL gas into the cages were pretty big, so tolerance must have been pretty high. Plus, none of the cages were sealed anymore, so the room was filling with the stuff anyways. I used to always think gases rise to the roof of a place anyways, but maybe only certain gases do that, and I still ain't sure if that would be one of them. You've got to realize I wasn't thinking about any of this science stuff at the time either. I was too focused on stopping everything Jacobs had been doing. So I got lucky on that part, especially with what I did next. However light or heavy it was, the gas they were using from that huge vat just endlessly produced the stuff. Well, it wasn't toxic. When I smashed my fists into the vat, it didn't break right away. I could feel it getting ready to, but it didn't. So I ran to the nearest cage, I grabbed hold of its RNTL pipe, and I sucked like it was soda through a straw. I already had more radiation exposure than anyone ever should, but I'd only been getting RNTL for my medicine. The pipe was like getting it straight to the vein for the five or six seconds I did it, and when I went back to that vat, I smashed a hole in the side like it was made of paper. There was no explosion or anything, but a weird black sludge started leaking out, and I heard a hiss that kept getting louder. The inside of that vat stank to high heaven, and I wanted to get away as quick as my legs would take me 
but first I wanted to be sure I'd done enough. I grabbed the fire extinguisher from right next to the vat and started spraying it in there, just in case it would mess up the brewing or mixing or whatever was going on. Then, when I thought about how easy it had been to smash a hole in the vat, I just ran around the whole thing and punched 15 or 20 times until I destroyed the structure and the whole thing fell to the ground in more pieces than I could count. One of the scientists with a notebook was cowering on his knees when I ran towards what I hoped would be an escape route. I asked if he had a car, and he was too scared to lie. They must have been paying him well, because the key he handed over was for a nice little ride. I ain't no thief, so I asked where he lived, and when he said Magdenville, I told him that's where he'd find his car when I was finished with it. There was already a brawl when I got to the room behind the hole I smashed in the wall between all the prisoners I let out and the guards who came to stop us. We outnumbered them four or five to one, even without factoring in our strength advantages. And as much as I could understand how angry the young guys were, I told them to stop. Everyone had seen my strength, even before I upped my RNTL dosage, so I didn't need to ask any of them twice. At the top of the ladder in that smaller storage room, I ripped off some of the gantry's railing to use as a homemade spear in case anyone tried to stop me on the other side of the door. They didn't, and I never even saw Jacobs or his guys again. I led the way to fresh air, and when we got outside, the prisoners behind me started jumping around like nothing I'd ever seen. I told them this was a second chance. I said I'd never forget a face and that I would look up the names of everyone who had been here, and if they didn't go straight and clean up their act, they'd have me to deal with. I might have stretched the truth a little bit there because I doubt there's a list, and I'm actually not good at names, but it was all for a good cause. I guess I had my doubts or guilts about causing the prison break, but I still say I couldn't have left them in there and especially not when I didn't know what the air would be like once I destroyed the vat. It was easy to find my ride because there weren't any others matching my key, but it wasn't a getaway car. Don't think like that. When I made that drive to Magdenville, I wasn't running away from what happened. I was running to share what happened. It took a while, and I might have taken a wrong turn or two, but there was still a little bit of daylight when I got there. I pulled up near a young kid and asked him where I might find some law around there. He looked at me all scared, and then I saw myself in the mirror and remembered my face. Benny's makeup had worn off a long time ago, and I was back to lobster red. There was an accident, I told the boy. I just got to tell the sheriff or someone what happened. He pointed the way, and I drove on without scaring him anymore. I wouldn't call what I did next turning myself in because I still don't know if what I did was wrong. I know there's laws and there's crimes, but they don't always match with the rights and the wrongs when things get complicated like they did for me. Besides, I had no place else to go. I walked inside, I stood at the desk, and I told the man straight, My name is Darren Murphy, and I just did something I wish I hadn't had to do. I don't know what he thought I was going to tell him, but I know it wasn't what he heard. I told him everything. Everything. The law boys down there in Magdenville were pretty good to me, all things considered. I've barely said a single word to anyone in the week since I first told them this story, right until I started telling you today. However you want to take it, and whatever you might have heard from anyone else, this is my side of the story. It started at the start, and it's ending at the end, just like every good story should. So all that's left to say now, I guess, is thanks for listening. Judgment Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Murphy, the judge said. Everyone in the small courtroom sat in rapt attention eager to hear the next few words which would give a clear indication of what fate awaited Darren Murphy. Murphy's story had already captured the public's attention far more than he knew. With word having gotten out, courtesy of the workers at the facility he all but destroyed, and also from some of the thankful prisoners he freed, 
The judge continued, You engaged in some very serious criminal damage in the course of your actions, but it has to be stated that what was going on under the watch of James Jacobs has shocked the people of this country and many of our government officials. This was a rogue program, for which others in high office might soon have very serious charges to answer, but for now, I will return to today's judgment. Murphy, who had been through more than most could ever imagine, was attending his hearing in an ill-fitting shirt provided by the county. It barely covered the wristbands he was wearing, which had been brought to his holding cell in Magdenville at his own request. Things are rarely black and white, but that is true here more than ever, the judge said. I understand that you have your own concerns about the power you have developed, Mr. Murphy, and we all appreciate that you have actively sought to restrain it. Nevertheless, until such a time as the power has been studied and your physical and mental states have been fully assessed to an independent panel's satisfaction, I hereby insist that you will have to remain in a monitored facility. Darren Murphy's expression didn't flinch. He'd played enough cards with his former roommate Benny to know that the judge had more to say and that things might not be as bad as they sounded so far. I am not sentencing you to prison and I am not recommending a psychiatric institution the judge went on, only that she'll be fully tested and monitored. A medical setting strikes me as the most appropriate, but I wish to stress again that this will not be a psychiatric institution, and that a return to your old life might well be possible before too long if the assessment results allow it. Murphy cleared his throat, then waited for the judge to explicitly encourage him to speak. When permission came, he gave his first reaction to this atypical sentencing, if such a word was fully suitable. I don't think my old life as I knew it is coming back, Murphy said, with a slight grin. But I thank you for leaving the door open. I want to be studied, checked, and rechecked, so I have no problem with what you've laid out. But if I can ask a question... Go on, the judge allowed. Well... You're not stipulating that I could only be allowed out if my power is somehow removed for good, or at least until something stronger than these bands can block it. It probably sounds like I'm arguing against my interests here, but a big part of me doesn't trust this power, even in my own hands. The judge, indeed, looked surprised that Murphy did seem to be making a case in opposition to his own freedom. As a matter of fact, Mr. Murphy, I received trusted advice to very carefully reconsider such a suggestion, which is one I had thought about stipulating. A whistleblower from the facility you damaged, who saw the full extent of your strength, believes that permanently stunting or removing it could be something we would regret in months or years to come. I share your concerns about the so-called nuclear-powered super-soldiers being sought by the rogue agents you exposed, but I also share the whistleblower's view that in certain circumstances, we might well wish we had a sound-minded individual of unique strength. Murphy furrowed his brow in thought. You mean like if there ever was really a problem with the Soviets? Or like Jacob said when he showed me the chest? You know, a problem with, uh, space aliens? That one seems rather far-fetched, the judge said a smile briefly cracking on his lips before he brought it under control. But there really is no black and white. I certainly see a case for the argument that the nation or the world might be best served by your retention of your newfound strength, for preparedness sake, if nothing else. Murphy saw where the judge was coming from and didn't disagree. But touching back on what you said a minute ago, he mused, do you really think I could go back to something like my normal life? I don't think too much alone time would be good for me. I can do it for a while when I have to, but the past week has been tough. If I couldn't see people and tell my stories, even if there's no more tour guiding, I don't know what I'd do with myself. Time will tell on the specifics, Mr. Murphy, the judge said as he straightened his papers, signaling that he was almost done, but something tells me you won't be short of stories to tell or people to hear them. Murphy's legal counsel, provided by the county, just like his ill-fitting shirt, confirmed that he was satisfied with this preliminary hearing. Further details would be ironed out the following day, prior to which Murphy would return to the holding cell for one final night, but the day had gone as well as either man could have reasonably expected. 
leaving the courtroom not in chains or handcuffs, but merely two wristbands and under the watchful eye of two officers, Murphy stepped out towards their waiting vehicle. To his amazement, the steps of the court and the street outside were packed with reporters and members of the public alike. No one had been around when he arrived, so word had evidently leaked out in the few hours since then. A giant white sign with red letters caught Murphy's eye right away, thrust in the air by a boy of around 15 years. Its message was simple. Free Megaton Murphy. Murphy chuckled at the moniker, then glanced around and saw it on a few more signs and placards. It now looked as though this nickname had come into wide usage, rather than being uniquely used by the first boy he spotted. Mr. Murphy! Mr. Murphy! One particularly deep-voiced radio reporter asked, pushing to the front and making himself heard over the others. Are you glad this all happened, or would you rewind the clock if you could? It was Murphy's legal counsel rather than the officers who tried to hurry him along, but he held his ground and addressed the reporter. After a week without a tour group to entertain, a rapt crowd was a welcome sight. And even more pertinently, after a week in a cell, any amicable human contact was to be cherished. I'm glad it didn't happen to anyone else, Murphy replied. With what people are saying and with what the judge laid out, maybe it ain't so bad. You guys should hear exactly what the judge said soon, but it wasn't bad. And yeah, if it was all going to happen to someone, then I guess it might as well have been me. The crowd cheered, and a dozen more reporters threw questions and microphones Murphy's way. But the officers this time stepped in to usher him to their vehicle. And there he goes, Darren Megaton Murphy, the deep-voiced reporter said. Remember the name, ladies and gentlemen because I have a feeling we'll be hearing a lot more of it. Thank you for listening to Megaton Murphy. Written by Craig A. Falconer. Narrated by Eric Reed. Text and production copyright 2021 by Craig A. Falconer. All rights reserved.